on this episode of It's a Miracle. A television show provides a woman with a clue to her past. There was something that told me it was just meant for me to know at this point that I was supposed to follow through with this somehow. And what she discovers oh, oh will gosh. change her life forever. Plus, a scenic canyon year. hike becomes a terrifying go. ordeal for a father and his okay. teenage Look sons. Hey! Run! I was running for my life. I didn't think I was going to make it. And finally, it stopped. And there was this moment of real terror for me because I knew I was alive, but I didn't know about my voice. These stories and more on this episode of It's a Miracle. Oh my God. And now, your host, Richard Thomas. Hello, and welcome to It's a Miracle. If the odds of lightning striking twice in the same place are astronomical, think of what the odds of a miracle striking twice must be. Well, you're about to meet some people who have experienced double miracles in their lives, and their stories are truly remarkable. First, two brothers who learned the hard way how one good turn deserves another. In February of 1991, Lloyd Fickett and his two sons, Jason and Cody, headed out on what they thought would be a simple afternoon adventure. Be careful now, watch your head coming through. All right. There was this great canyon hike that we heard that was really scenic, and so we decided we'd do that. Now we got a little bit of a climb here. Yeah, we're never gonna get there. Yeah. We're almost there, I promise you. Yeah, it turned out to be a lot more arduous than we had any idea. It's not that bad. And they would say to me, Dad, how much further? <laughs> and couldn't we turn around, you know? And then, oh, come on, it's just a little further. Careful of the rocks. It wasn't just a level hike. You had to hike up over rocks and down. So we would keep going, and finally we got to the end of this canyon. And it was great. It was a really scenic place. Look at that. Look at that sky. Smell that air. Isn't that beautiful? Great. My feet are killing me. While the climb was tiring for Lloyd's oldest son, Jason, it was well worth the effort. Take a look at Whenever my dad and my brother and I would hang out, it was a blast. You can see almost the entire history. Our dad was trying to build a tradition of us just having this time together so we, the three of us could kind of just bond. You could see almost the entire history of the planet. As they sat enjoying the canyon's tranquil beauty, suddenly the peace was shattered. Hey! Hey! What are you doing? There are people down here! I remember looking up and thinking, I can't believe someone's throwing rocks down at us to scare us. Boys, let's go! Let's get out of here! But it wasn't someone trying to scare them. It was a massive landslide. The whole mountain was just falling down on us. sound was just all these explosions just going off around me. It's what I imagine is the closest thing you can experience to war. Just this constant explosions and barrage all around you. And then I felt something hit me. Closer to the cliff, Cody and Lloyd were in even more danger. I was running for my life. I didn't think I was going to make it. Finally, it stopped. And then there was this moment of real terror for me because I knew I was alive, but I didn't know about my voice. <laughs> Cody had escaped injury, but Jason was not as lucky. Oh my God! <laughs> when I first saw the wound, I couldn't believe it. What am I, Jason? It looked like. Uh, 
hunk of his calf had been ripped away. My fear was that if we didn't get this taken care of quickly, we could have a life threatening situation that, you know, I could lose my son. It'll be all right. Though just a teenager at the time, it was Cody who took charge of the situation. He was immediately offering his t shirt as we started to figure out a strategy of what to do. Tie around his leg. Okay. Oh my God. Make sure it's tight, okay? Remembering his Boy Scout training, Cody told his dad to apply direct pressure to the wound while he ran to get help. Can you make it? Yeah, You're Cody took off running two miles to get help, which is an extraordinary thing for Cody because Cody has asthma, and this has always, you know, been a problem for him. As Cody frantically maneuvered his way through the rugged terrain, another hiker arrived on the scene, and together they attempted to move Jason down the mountain. I'll never forget some of these rocks we had to climb over, and it was just inch by inch for us. We had to take a step, and then Jason had to grab a hold of his good leg. And Jason would hold his injured leg, put his weight on me. Don't draw me, Dad. So it was an uh, arduous, unbelievably difficult hike and, and, and scary. I have really started to be worried about Cody because I didn't know where Cody was. I didn't know what was happening. It was only 14. This was a really difficult hike. Lots of opportunities to get lost. He could have had an asthma attack. There was just so many things that could have happened. But miraculously, he arrived at the main road without incident. And even more incredibly, discovered two rangers there, equipped with the necessary gear to rescue his brother. And moments later, Cody and the rangers were on their way back up the canyon. He's right up ahead. He's right up ahead. When we saw the rangers showing up, and there was Cody. It was one of the biggest reliefs in my life to see he's alive, he made it, and oh my God, to get help. We're on our way now, son. Okay, let's go. Okay. Let's go. Thanks to Cody's quick thinking and fearless actions, Jason was on his way to the hospital. I don't think I realized how instrumental Cody was in having me get to the hospital and how perfectly he had acted in helping me get out of that. After the operation, after I was home, I started to appreciate more how heroically he acted and was proud that he's my brother. I don't know how we would have dealt with it without the way Cody responded and the way he took charge, the way he volunteered, the way he was just right there with us. It was like the moment called for him to let go of being a child, and he stepped forward, and he really became a man that day. To me, he was a hero. It was a situation that could easily have gone the other way. I definitely think it's a miracle that, with all the rocks that were raining down, you just would take one rock in the head, and you would be dead. And how that didn't happen to anyone, and how the worst that happened is what happened to me is a miracle. Jason Pickett's life has been saved by the quick thinking and actions of his younger brother, Cody. If it's true that each of our lives has a greater purpose, Jason is about to discover his in a very dramatic way. We'll be right back. Going again? Gardner Canyon. Ten years after their narrow escape from a rock slide, Jason and Cody Fickett were heading out for another weekend in the wilderness. Cody's wife, Risa, was there to see them off. Okay. It was a gorgeous weekend. I actually wanted to go camping too, but I wanted Cody and Jason to have their, you know, brotherly alone time. It had been a little while since I'd been able to spend some time with my brother, and I know he really likes camping. Enough time to get some wood. It's not an activity that Jason would normally choose for himself, however. I got the stuff. All right. Being with my brother camping, I always feel very comfortable. Oh, this is nice up here. I just trust him completely with 
my life and with his intelligence about being out in the wildlife. That's how you light a fire. It's a good looking fire. So we started a fire and it was really nice out. Cool, but not too cold. I can't believe I finally got you up here. So we decided to just lay some sleeping bags out and just sleep under the stars. Hey, Cody, thanks for getting me out here. Anytime. So we talked for a little while, and then I started getting tired first. Good night. Good night, Jace. So I went to sleep, and about 15 minutes later, he went to sleep. The brothers slept peacefully, unaware of the danger that lurked just outside the warmth of the fire. right away that something was attacking my brother. I just started screaming at whatever it was. And I hit whatever it was with both my hands to knock it off of Cody. And then I was waking up, I realized it was a bear that was pulling him away. Jason watched in horror as the bear dragged Cody further from the camp. He knew he had to act fast. And that second time I hit it, I hit it hard enough that it dropped Cody and just took like one step back and the bear just stood there looking at me. So I went through this one primal scream to try and make it run away. Ah! And I had this rush of like adrenaline and anger and power. Jason, help me out. Cody, you all right? Jason, help me out. Oh, Cody. And I turned from the bear and started to help Cody up. And that was really the scariest moment. As Jason struggled to move his brother to safety, he prayed that the bear wouldn't attack again. And it just stood there and watched me walk him back to Cody's car. Once there, a new fear gripped him. He didn't know how to drive a stick shift. I was like, oh my God, I have to now drive a car I don't know how to drive to get my brother out of here. His shirt was wringing wet with blood, and my first thought was he was going to die because there was so much blood. But in spite of his injuries, Cody was still conscious. So he was talking me through how to get it in the first and let off the clutch, put on the gas. Just easy, 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 easy. Okay. We had to drive through this really rocky terrain, and at each rock we drove over was really painful for him because it bounced his neck. And it was three in the morning and pretty cold at this point. And with all the blood on him, he was freezing. Okay. God, I'm cold. I'm so cold. So I gave him the sweater I had and we wrapped it around his neck to kind of help support his head. It was frightening and terrifying, but how clear-headed he was. That just made it so much easier. It was like teamwork. It was like we were in this together. Keep it in third. Keep it in third. Just keep it in third here. All right. It was a good 15, 20 minute drive out to the main paved road. And it was a pretty scary ride. If he had been unconscious, I don't know how I would have made it. Hold on, brother. Finally, a ray of hope. Oh, I see a payphone. I see a payphone. We drove into the gas station. It was closed, but they had two payphones outside of it. Hang in there, brother. Jason quickly called 911, and a few minutes later, a helicopter arrived to transfer Cody to a hospital back in Tucson. I knew once they had Cody in the helicopter, and once he was on his way to the hospital, I knew he was gonna be fine. And for the first time that night, Jason understood the enormity of what had just happened. I had this moment and in that moment, I realized I had saved my brother's life. 
It felt less like an accomplishment and more like something I'd been blessed with. Jason's sense of being blessed was shared by Risa when the extent of Cody's injuries became clear. When I got to the hospital, I was more nervous because they didn't let me see him. The doctor said that the bear had physically broken or cracked or fractured five vertebrae in his neck and that his arm was numb and there were more important injuries like nerves. We realized how lucky we are that the bear did miss major arteries. Obviously, Cody was able to walk away from the injuries, so really we were just so thankful he was alive. Jason, good to see you. It was yeah, a sentiment too. shared by everyone involved. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm okay. When I got into the hospital, yeah, it's Cody took my hand and said, you know, we made it. Listen, Jace, thanks for saving my life. Of course, you're my brother. I'm just amazingly grateful that I was there and that it worked out the way it did. I don't think I would have made it without you. Everything that was done was done by my brother. You're gonna be okay. You're gonna make it. He was able to be my defense for me. I think so. You know, so obviously I'm quite lucky that he was there. I was there, I woke up right away. And the bites were just in the right way, not deep enough. And it does seem like a miracle that everything, even in the attack, was just so that Cody survived. And I think Cody and I both agree that he had the worst luck possible <laughs> to get attacked by the bear. But after that, it seems like everything since that moment has gone perfectly. Today, Cody is well on his way to recovery, and everyone close to him believes that his life and theirs have been touched by two miracles. Jason saved Cody's life, and I think he feels his cosmic debt is paid <laughs> as far as Cody saving his life before. I'm so proud of both of them. They're both heroes in both situations. You just never know what you're made of until you get tested in the way they've been tested. For Cody and Jason, the bond of brotherhood is something they will always be grateful for. We've talked about from time to time the other incident where, where I've saved his life and now this incident where he saved mine, and we both kind of joke around about it. Okay, look, man, we're even. Enough. No more. Okay. That's it. We're even. We paid each other back. Okay, we're fine. It's always been throughout Cody's and my life that we can always count on each other completely. That we've both saved each other's life, it confirms what we've always known, that that's what we would do. I feel it's a miracle that we've always been there for each other. We'll be back with another double miracle right after this. To fully appreciate our next double miracle, we must first return to a story that we presented several years ago. It's a daring rescue that for one of the people involved will be a life-changing event. It was April 4th, 1995. An unusual two-day rainstorm had filled the Pacoima Wash in Los Angeles, California with three feet of water. That afternoon, four children who lived nearby climbed through a hole in the fence to check out the rising waters, which were by now moving downhill at a rate of 25 miles per hour. But the children were unaware of the danger as they dared each other to cross the wash to the other side. And when no one volunteered, the children decided to give their friend Jordan a little push. At that same moment, best friends Rick Monsoor and off-duty police officer Mike Grasso were driving over the wash when something caught Mike's eye. We backed up and we looked again, and it looked like some clothes or maybe somebody was in the water and it was whipping him along. And we both looked at each other at the same time and said, 
I got a bad feeling about this. I think both of us thought for a minute we imagined it, and then it was almost simultaneously we got the idea that we can't just drive off and pretend we didn't see something. We gotta go make sure it was either nothing or something and then act accordingly. As Rick raced to the next overpass, Officer Grosso could see that the object he'd spotted earlier was coming down the wash. I looked over the side and I saw him go underneath us and I ran across and I grabbed the hole of the lock and I've never seen that type of lock before. Try to catch it down here. Go, go. Officer Grosso carried keys to most LA city locks, but they were just outside the city limits. And so Rick sped off to the next gate. And we found this gate and one thing after another was just perfect. I ran up to the gate, my key slid into this lock as if it was brand new opened right up, the gate swung right up, and boom, we were off. As they raced along the edge of the water, Mike couldn't see the boy, but kept praying that if they drove fast enough, they'd get in front of him in time to stop his rapid descent down the wash. This whole area is a downhill run and he got up to almost 40 miles an hour on this run. I saw him coming down. I had enough time to look at Rick, yell at him to call 911. I reached down, I, I pulled my belt open, and I looked over, and I saw him come up out of the water. I took my steps and I dove. Next thing I knew, boom, I was underwater. I was flipping around, I, I felt the boy in one hand, and I had something else in my other hand. And when my head cleared water, I had the boy in my left hand and a man in my right hand. The man who had been hidden beneath the boy and Officer Grasso now clutched both of them as he headed down the river. Meanwhile, Rick Mansour's 911 call had alerted LA Fire Department's Hook and Ladder Unit 98 to the tragedy unfolding. Would they arrive on time? I kept the boy in my left hand, I kept the man in my right hand, and we raced towards the wall. About 50, 60 feet before the wall, my brain kicked in and said, if we're traveling this fast and you hit that wall, it's gonna tear your arm off. And so at the last minute, I just leaned my body across and I hit the wall with my stomach and my chest. And all of a sudden, I was out of the water. And what had happened was the force of the, water, of the water behind me had pushed me up the wall. And I grabbed the boy and pulled him up and put him in front of me. And as they sat there, a crowd of people gathered to help the man who'd landed farther downstream, where a fishing net was quickly lowered to pull him to safety. The mystery man had been rescued. But who was he? And how had he ended up in the water? The only feasible explanation was that he too had seen the boy fighting for his life and had risked his own life to save him. But no one will know for sure, for shortly after he was rescued, he disappeared, never to be seen again. Meanwhile, the Los Angeles Fire Department was lifting the young boy to safety and with only moments to spare. Already, his body temperature had dropped to 89 degrees, and by the time Officer Grasso was rescued, he too was suffering from hypothermia. They were both rushed to a nearby emergency room. Looking back on the events of that day, it's clear that someone was watching over little Jordan. How else can you explain how Mike Grasso and Rick Monsoor crossed the bridge at the exact moment needed to spot the young boy in the wash. Or how another man risked his own life and may have kept the boy afloat long enough for Officer Grasso to come to the rescue. Any Los Angeles police officer that day would have done exactly the same thing. So it's not me, it's just that someone else, someone larger than us, didn't want anything to happen to Jordan, and he set up all these dominoes to fall just the right way. Everything worked out absolutely perfect. 
and everybody walked away and no one was hurt. Who will experience a second miracle in their life? Will it be Mike Grasso, Rick Monsoor, the young boy who was rescued, or the mysterious man who got away? Find out right after this. It's a Miracle will return. One of the people in the story you just saw is about to experience a second miracle in their life, one that would not have been possible if they hadn't been a part of that miraculous rescue. But before we find out who the lucky person is, we must first meet a young woman who lived thousands of miles away, and her story is a miracle in itself. From the time she was a small child, Renee Tucker had a distant relationship with her father. My father traveled a lot. We maybe saw him for a couple days every couple weeks. So when they divorced, we really didn't know a lot of difference. We were still at home with mom like we had been before. Though life went on, there was something that continued to bother Renee. I had always known that I was different from my brother and my sister simply because of our appearances. My sister was fair-skinned with light hair, and my brother was the same, and here I am in the middle with the dark hair, the dark skin, the dark eyes, and just sort of wondered, okay, how did that happen? Renee learned the answer when her mother confessed to having had a relationship with another man. I believe I was 11. My mother told me what happened. Before you were born, your father and I were in the middle of getting a divorce. Some years ago, when she and the man I knew as my dad had separated, she met another man. Your real father, his name is Rick Monsoor. She told me how they met, that they became friends, that I was conceived, and he was on his way to Vietnam. She also learned that shortly after Rick left for the war, her parents had reconciled and decided to raise baby Renee as their own. Her mother never saw Rick Monsoor again. She had a lot of positive things to say about him and his character. She had even a few mementos that she had kept from their time together. This is a card that he gave me on Valentine's Day. You were conceived on Valentine's Day. It was a big thing to find out that suddenly you were different. After my mother told me the story, there was a letter written to the last address that my mother had for him, and the letter was returned to us, basically marked no one here by that name, returned to sender. The letter appeared to have been opened so there was always the lingering questions of who opened it, who read it. Was there a choice not to have contact? It was just a large question mark in my life, not knowing, trying to push those thoughts and feelings down, repress them. Renee eventually married and started a family of her own. But even years later, she still had unanswered questions. Happy Father's Day, Dad! Hey, thank you. Father's Day would be a time when it would cross my mind. Open it up. There would be Open movies that you might watch or a program where someone was being reunited with someone they had never known. And of course, it would come to mind and, you know, the thought would be, wow, I wonder if that would ever happen to me. And then, in November of 2000, as Renee's husband, Shelley, was flipping through the channels on TV, one particular show caught his attention. ...was coming down the wall. The segment was about a child that had fallen into a storm drain, and the narrator explained that the police officer and his best friend 
were trying to rescue him. Renee was working nearby in the kitchen. I heard the name Rick Monsoor from the television. What name did they just say? He hadn't paid that close of attention and couldn't confirm for me, so I sat down and we watched. Moments later, Renee received her confirmation. Go make sure it was either nothing or something and then act accordingly. We got a I was just glued to looking at this space. It was just there for a few seconds, wondering if by some miracle I could be looking at my actual father on my television. At that point, the program ended, and you know, I looked at my husband and I said, is that possible? Do you think that could be him? Renee learned the program would be rebroadcast the following day and decided to tape it. I had known the name for years, but seeing the face really set it off for me. Or something and then act accordingly. There was something deeper that told me it was just meant for me to know at this point that I was supposed to follow through with this somehow. Since the story had featured LAPD officer Mike Grasso, Renee decided to begin her search with him. Los Angeles Police Department. They gave me a telephone number and I called it. Hi, um, Mr. Grasso, I'm trying to find out some information about your friend Rick Monsoor. What type of information? Well, it's sort of a complicated story. She was very vague. So I was a little suspicious because I have no idea who this woman was and she was trying to track down Rick. Finally, I just said, tell me who you are and it'll be a lot easier. And she said, well, I think I'm his daughter. And I went, oh, okay. Well, the problem is, is that Rick's recently... He then proceeded to tell me that he did not believe that Rick would be the man that I was looking for because... Quite frankly, he didn't think he was old enough to be my father. Okay, well, I uh, thank you for your time. So at that point, I think I sort of resigned myself to say, okay, this is the end, let's drop this. The emotional conclusion when it's a miracle continues. Shortly after her parents divorced, Renee Tucker learned that her biological father was a man named Rick Monsoor. And though she tried to contact him, her efforts were unsuccessful. And then, 24 years later, Renee heard his name mentioned on a television program and her search began anew. This time, she would get as far as a friend of Rick Monsoor's, only to be told that he was too young to be her father. And so, once again, Renee gave up her search. But Mike Grasso wasn't going to let it end there. Hello. Hey, Rick, it's Mike. Hey, Mike, how are you, buddy? What's up? And I said, hey, Ricky, <laughs> Can you sit go down? sit down. <laughs> Mike, I can't sit down. I'm shopping here. Just talk to me. What's up? Well, I think I just spoke to your daughter. Uh, Ricky. At that point, on, I told Michael I would call him back as soon as I found a place to go sit down for a minute. As Officer Grosso's words began to sink in, Rick's thoughts returned to a moment in time 35 years earlier. At some point in the beginning of 1965, I was told that I would be shipping out and going to Vietnam. And just before I left to go home on leave, I was informed that Betty was pregnant. I was 18 years old at that point, and I didn't fully comprehend, I guess. I didn't understand everything, and I, quite frankly, had a whole big agenda that was facing me that seemed pretty tall. Rick went to Vietnam with the understanding that the baby he'd fathered would be put up for adoption. 
When years later, he and his wife, Kayleen, considered looking for his child, the task seemed daunting. It was very difficult because I didn't know how to start and I just was really afraid of what I would find. I'm more the big cuddly guy. I don't want to be rejected. I don't want to be, you know, like turned away. And, you know, there was that possibility. But Rick knew that he had to take the risk. Hey, Mike. Hi. And we talked for a few minutes, and he says, you know, if this is something that you don't want to do, I could just call and say that you're the wrong guy. And I said, no, I don't believe that I'm the wrong guy, though. I think I'm the right guy. I want you to call her up and tell her that I should be home within a couple hours and that I will give her a call then. I was compelled to talk. I had to call and talk to her. This was the beginning of a journey, not anywhere near the end, and I had no real idea of where it was going to go. It seemed like it took forever to dial the numbers. I just was so concerned that I would not be able to justify myself and make myself out to be the person that I wanted to be perceived as. Hello? Hi, this is Renee. This is Renee. Hi, Renee. Uh, this, this is Rick Monsoor. Hi, Rick Monsoor. I think neither one of us was really clear on I, what to say. I'm a little nervous right now, but I just thought that we should talk. I'm nervous, too. I had no, different no, thoughts going no, through no. my mind. I remember feeling elated. I remember no. tears, crying. I don't know what to start with. I'm really glad you called. That first phone call was not one I'll ever forget. I just felt emotional, just emotional. And it was really like this giant, incredible weight being lifted. I just knew that it was something that was meant to be. I couldn't question that. I'm glad you called. Through phone calls and email, Rick and Renee's relationship continued to grow. On Valentine's Day, I got a very touching note from Rick, basically telling me that he would like to have a true father-daughter type relationship and that he would be a part of my life for the rest of his life if I would let him. And for the first time, he actually signed the letter, your father, Rick. And that was a very emotional moment for me. Seven weeks later, Renee waited anxiously to meet her newfound father for the first time, and It's a Miracle was there to capture the miraculous moment. I guess the anxiety, the nervousness and everything just sort of came to the top. We're lost. I took the wrong turn coming off the plane. So it doesn't oh, seem like that so long. What? Did you see him? Oh, I see him. <laughs> Hi. Unbelievable. As we embraced for the first time, everyone around us clapped. Oh, you sweetheart. That first embrace was pretty amazing. Uh, they had to push me out. <laughs> I'm big, I'm mean, but I was chicken. <laughs> I can't help but think that it just was all supposed to be just this way at just that time. We have a young boy falling into a wash, but for the grace of God, there. What if she hadn't have been in the kitchen? What if her husband had left the TV off? What if? Leave it here. It just had to be one of those things that was gonna just happen. And I'm, I'm so happy it did. I really, really am. I have now a sense of completeness that I've never had before. <laughs> After 35 years, a daughter is reunited with her father. When she wasn't looking, he wasn't looking. 
it was a true miracle that brought us together. You know, anyone who believes that nothing good can come from watching television hasn't met Renee Tucker and Rick Monsoor. And they join us once again from Renee's home in Conyers, Georgia. Hello there. Hi, Richard. Hi, Richard. We're really glad to be here. We're really glad to have you. Renee, I hear that you've brought something along with you. Would you like to tell us about it? I have a letter that was written to Rick several years ago. I believe I was 12 when this letter was written. And I do have it with me. Rick, you never received this letter, and I know how much it meant to Renee. Well, Renee, you finally have your chance to tell him what you were feeling back then. It says, hello, Mr. Monsoor. I guess you'll be surprised to get a letter from me. Let me introduce myself, Renee Michelle Gillentine. My mother told me about what happened between you and her while you were stationed in Fort Benning, Georgia. I've been thinking a lot about you. I mean, I would just like to know what you look and act like. I wish you could come to visit me one time, but if you can't, please send pictures of yourself. I'm sending school pictures. They were made last year. I've changed some since these were made. I hope you get this letter, read it, and understand how I feel and why I would like to see you. Well, since I've told you all I know to say at this time, I think I'll sign off hoping to hear from you. Love your daughter, Renee. Well, Rick, how do you feel hearing this letter for the first time after all these years? It's emotional. It's, it's the kind of thing that is probably the hardest part of this whole beautiful thing. I mean, I wish I could have gotten that letter, but... You know, it doesn't change who I am or who Renee is, and we'll just go from here wherever we have to. Can't look back, gotta look forward. Well, we've got another surprise for you. An opportunity to make a miracle happen in someone else's life. Wendy's Restaurants has agreed to donate $1,000 to the charity of your choice. Wow, I think that's great. Fantastic. Now, I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you have a favorite charity? Um, if I had to give a favorite, I think I would have to stay with the Cancer Society because we've had close relatives affected by that and would like to support it in any way we could. Well, Wendy's will see that they get the donation in both your names as father and daughter. That's fantastic. Thank you. And thank you for sharing your wonderful story with us. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. We'll be right back. Well, that's our show for now. Thank you for joining us, and a special thanks to all the people who shared their remarkable stories tonight on It's a Miracle. It's our hope that whenever you need one, you'll find a miracle in your life, too. Until next time, I'm Richard Thomas. Goodbye. <laughs>